All, All right. right. Well, welcome everyone. I'm I'm Har Harmonics, and this is the panel discussion. Um, the, the the topic of this is live coding in Asia Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, um, and how it's happening locally and connecting with others. Uh, this uh, panel discussion is part of the uh, or the whole event is part of the ICLC. It's a satellite event and. Um, uh, since ICLC is in uh, NYU Shanghai this year, they had a theme of uh, regional symmetry. So we wanted to do a, uh, a, a discussion and talk about you know live coding in 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 those regions. And so that's uh, I want to give some highlight to that. Um, so this discussion uh, is going to be pretty informal, and uh, I'm hoping not to talk very much because I'm not in the region. So I really want to let you know those of you that are that are uh, um, you know you know you know that are, that are involved uh, uh, do most of the talking. Um, so why don't we start with just a quick round of introductions? So why don't each of you spend you know a, a, a quick minute just saying uh, you know where you're located and in introduce yourself and what your live coding practice is. Who will start? I'll start. I'll volunteer. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Rennick Bell, and I grew up in Texas, but when I was 26, I moved to Asia, and I spent uh, about five years in Taiwan, and then 15 in Tokyo after that, and then back to three more in Taiwan, and now I'm a little more than a half year in in Vietnam, and I've done live coding sort of all over, and I've organized an algorithm in Hong Kong, and I've played at an event in uh, Thailand now, and so I, I, I've seen a bit of what's going on, but I'm eager to hear about the events in China and sort of dis disappointed that I can't get over there uh, for ICLC this time. Uh, but that's, that's uh, and, and I've been live coding for a long time, I guess, since uh, around, uh, my, my first experiments with it, I guess, go back to around like 2006, 2007. Yeah, so please, uh, somebody else introduce yourself. Are we moving in, in order of time zones or something like that? <laughs> I think Bernard should go first then. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Bernard Gray. My uh, my handle that you guys may know me is, is Cleary. Um, I've been live coding since COVID. Uh, around April 2020 was when I had the opportunity and the capability to sit down and actually actually learn stuff. I've been I've been following Tidal as a as a language since about 2017. Um, things that I've done, I've I've played quite a few of these algo raids. I've spent a lot of time chatting to people in the on the community. Um, I spend a, quite a bit of time playing with people in the community. I, every Sunday morning, I get on Estuary and we invite people to come along and, and jam with us. Abinay's played with us before. Um, I know uh, Ranga was a possibility for this. He's not here, but I've played with him a few times and we have a few regulars and we get on and, and make noise for an hour, which is great fun. Um, I'm located in Australia. I'm located in a regional area of Australia and that's got its own unique challenges, particularly you know trying to communicate with people who are doing this in other areas of the world. So I have very early mornings usually. And yeah, I have played an algo rave i did that in 2022 we actually ran one in australia as part of the australian computer human interactivity uh, conference um, i've done quite a lot of workshops here just to try and spread the word and that's been uh fairly successful we've had quite a few people interested in it um i've unsuccessfully um not really generated too much of a community but that's an ongoing that's an ongoing project so that's me. I might pass over to Claudia, who's like my one success story from the, uh, <laughs> the local area. Yes, um, my name is Claudia Uzi, um, and I got into um, live coding because of one of the workshops of um, Bernie. Um, and and then since then, um, he's got a. Um, it's, he was really big in organising things and and trying to get people involved, which is something that got me involved. Um, in some of this stuff and um, and hanging on to a lot of things and probably more confident in visuals than with audio. But, um, 
yeah so <laughs> i'm very on the on the junior side of this um but i'm very keen to to get um and i'm very keen for this to get more attention and um a bit more following uh, so Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call out Abhinay. Hey, hey. So yeah, I'm Abhinay Kopperji. I am in India. Uh, I also come from a small town in India called Arabad, where nothing much happens now. I mean, it was a pretty important town for the country, but culturally it's dead now. So I kind of escaped uh, earlier. Uh, to try to get to a big city and like do more interesting things with it, which is where um, I found out that I can probably take programming and uh, music and visuals and all of that and do more things with it uh, or do my job faster or in a more interesting way, uh, which is how I discovered uh, live coding. Uh, been doing it for a while, uh, but I think what I was doing initially more was doing uh, it with more visual programming languages like Max, uh, rather than typing hard code. Uh, but then I think it was 2017, late 2017, 2018 or so, uh, this other collaborator of mine, she mentioned on a random Facebook group that anyone into this whole algorithm thing. And I, had, I used to be in the UK, uh, in the early parts of 2010s and that's when alex i think and a bunch of others did a few events and i out of the blue went there and saw that okay these guys are doing exactly what we were doing uh in like art gallery gigs and no one was interested but here people are partying with the same thing so maybe the key is show people what we are doing and make it to our work and that might uh get people more interested in uh, maybe the idea of how how you do this or uh, just the uh, aesthetic of it. Because, I mean, I come from more experimental side of things. So that, that I mean, whereas it, Indian music is what most people know is Bollywood, <laughs> which tends to keep it safe. Uh, I mean, it's all film music, essentially. So yeah, about... Six years back, we did our first al ever algorithm, and then uh, initially it was very institutional. But then we've been doing uh, events, kind of very, in a very indie way, since 2019. So today we are doing an algorithm in an hour and a half, actually two hours, uh, which uh, the first version of it was the the uh, first completely independent algorithm that we did, which had no institutional funding or anything involved. But we have gone and come back full circle because we used to have a venue back when we started doing this in Bangalore, but now it's become a house party because we literally cannot find a venue anywhere in Bangalore uh, because of the way things have gone, uh, I mean, in the art space. So yeah, I mean, I think we'll have more discussions happening around these things, so uh, I'll shut up now. Should I go next? Um, and hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Gohai. I'm, I'm one of the uh, organizers of the ICLC 2024 in, in Shanghai. Um, I think in some way, like even more more junior than, than anyone else, everyone else, uh, since I personally don't have a live coding practice at all. Um, so it's like, for me, it's, uh, I was really interested to kind of like, uh, learn more about it. Um, of course, like I was like, um, familiar or I've been familiar with, um, you know, live coding practices and like writing about live coding, uh, for kind of like, um, many years, um, kind of like as a, yeah, as an artist and as an educator, like a lot of, like I, I do I deal with code a lot and I think about code a lot and how we also in you know in the university how we how we teach code and um kind of like the struggles and the, the frictions of all of this um and um and somehow the the thought of um of kind of like um 
kind of introducing this to um, to the, our university community and introducing this to our students um, has been a really like um, yeah like yeah, in, interesting one. Um, I'm kind of like that, that's kind of what let let me and my colleague uh, Eric Perrin um, to kind of like apply to host um, yeah ICLC C this year. Uh, so yeah. Um, super nice to meet you all. Um, thank you so much. Hi, Harmonics, for, for hosting this. Cool. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm Alex. Um, I'm here in Sheffield, UK. Um, been involved in live coding for a while and um, made Tidal Cycles and collaborated on making Strudel more recently. Um, I have been to Tokyo, <laughs> thanks to Renick. Um, had a nice tour a few years ago with my friends Lucy Cheeseman and Johan Armitage, um, together with Renick and uh, uh, quite a few others, Atsuchi, Tadakoro, Akihiro Kubota. Um, that was a really nice experience, but apart from that, I haven't really explored too far to the east <laughs> um, uh, but more recently I've got really interested in um, Indian uh, rhythms particularly South Indian uh, conical rhythms um, uh, been uh, my main focus in thinking about algorithmic music um, so yeah I guess there's all these music's really interesting for how all these influences flow um, uh, as well as sort of forces of colonialism, you get kind of counter forces um, <laughs> where these practices sort of take over. Um, yeah, that's me anyway. Great, thanks, Th thanks everyone for those introductions, and I'm and I apologize to everyone that I'm I, I'm not on uh, video, not able to share my um, my, my 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 video stream. Um, but uh, let's let, let's try to get some discussion going. And 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 um, one of the topics that I think is really interesting is to think about live coding. Is it a global phenomenon or is it regional? And you know, it, or is it both? Um, uh, and uh, so specifically, what I mean about that is, you know, to what degree is live coding? Uh, specific to a local area, and what is it like to code in India? What is live? What is live coding practices in India versus uh, 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 versus you know Australia or uh, you know you know Rennick, you're, you're, uh, uh, have, have have been in um, uh, many different areas, or you know you know, you know go high. What are you uh, observing about live coding practices that are specific to a region, or maybe influenced by regional uh, uh, community or 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 uh, you know musical tr traditions and practices or or technology practices that 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 you know, live coding is not just about you know you know audio it can can can, it can involve um, you know visuals and um, or or is, or is live coding just purely you know global and that it doesn't really matter where you are and that that it's the the traditions that are uh, are so. Um, uh, uh, spread and 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 uh, you, you know that it, that 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 live coding um, doesn't it, uh, you know has a really global global presence. Um, so so with that as a theme, I think uh, maybe each you you can spend a a few minutes and talk about you know, what what live coding means in 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 your region or to what degree you you feel that there's a a, a regional uh, set of practices that maybe differentiates. Um, you know, you know, you know, in a live coding. Uh, so I don't know, Renick or Abine, do you want to start? Or anybody want to kick that off? I'm I'm happy to start and just sort of tell okay. what what I what I think the, the kind of history that I sort of see. Um, so I know that in the original Top Lap CD, uh, the reason I found my PhD advisor is because Kubota Sensei was on that CD as one of the uh, participants. So I think, as far as I can tell from within Asia, he might have been one of the first to sort of figure out that live coding was something cool to do. Um, and I think in Japan, it, it probably comes from a lot of experimental music scene, noise music scene, and uh, people trying to do weird things with technology like that. And so, and I think it started with music. He was doing also, I think I think he might have been a participant in a, in a thing called a breadboard band, where they were doing some kind of a live circuitry uh, music. 
and I, I think that was his start. And so then a lot of people sort of, I, I think he brought up some people and, uh, and then I had found him to do my PhD and then we tried to start doing algorithms because I had been influenced by Alex. So in that way, it's very global, right? So I had, I had seen Alex and others activities in, in Europe and I wanted to, uh, replicate that in Japan. But in fact, the first algorithm that I participated at was in Australia, in Sydney. Uh, and I think Nick Collins had a piece in that algorithm. He participated remotely and I'm not sure, but maybe Oliver Bound was one of the, uh, instigators of, instigators of that. So he's a Brit that had, uh, that had moved to teach in Australia. So I guess in that way, it's, it's very, it is very international and global. Um, and, and I, I think, uh, knowledge of the tools and so on, that, that also is very international, but I think there's also a, a local aspect to it too. And things kind of develop in their own ways. Um, so recently I've been to Thailand and I know that they just had, uh, something like an algorithm at a Thai culture museum where they tried to integrate Thai culture into all of the performances. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend there, but one of the organizers of that event, a guy called Kiang had come to Vietnam and he gave a, a workshop at a local DJ, like a creative studio or a DJ school about using Hydra for visuals. And so the people that went to this workshop, their approach, I think, I think it's fair to say that they probably don't have very much awareness of an international algorithm scene. And their interest was more specifically about learning some kind of cool and free tool for VJing that they can do uh, along with a DJ. So it, in that way, you could say that it's sort of that, that might be sort of Southeast Asian related. I mean, just, just by virtue of how it, how it came about and without so much knowledge of, uh, of sort of an international context in, and uh, about, or history, knowledge of history about uh, live coding or algorithm. Um, and then of course in Taiwan, I, I think it's also, it, it's got its local stuff that's going on in local universities and local events. Taiwan, I think doesn't get a lot of, uh, international visitors maybe compared to some other places like Japan or or the amount of international travel in uh in, in Europe uh, not not that it doesn't but probably to a lesser degree and they start to develop their own their own local scene so so I think that's why when we were talking earlier I think that in in many ways it's both very international and it sort of doesn't matter where you are and the tools are spreading uh quite freely but at the same time there are local things and uh, to get back to that in Japan um I think has sort of a strong uh local scene where they are developing a lot of their own independent tools and software idiosyncratic ones uh, that are run by just a single performer um and and maybe I wonder how much knowledge there is of what's actually going on in Japan there is uh outside of Japan so so I, I think even though some awareness about a local about a global scene inspired them. I'm not sure that their their works actually could get back out to further inspire the international scene. But I'd like to hear some uh, other perspectives. I, I mean, I, the one thread I keep seeing in uh, everywhere I go, try to bring people into the scene is there's some sort of noise music uh, something happening somewhere or the other. I mean, even I came in somewhat that way. I didn't call it noise music when I was doing it. I was just doing cool music with friends who did cool music uh, with just interesting methods. And uh, uh, some people started pointing towards something called noise music. And uh, I was like, okay, cool. There's some noises in there, but I mean, that's not what I'm trying to make. I'm, I'm trying to make it intentionally uh in uh i mean not that saying that noise music is not intentional but the way i keep bringing people in uh or try to connect them or try to even get to uh, get people to perform because there's a huge i either find people who are like completely uh intimidated by the idea of putting some code out like in front of people or manipulating code or uh, why why show people what what's going on in fact most of the time people who are very used to noise music they kept wondering why i want them to show their code uh, and how does that improve the the aesthetic or the performance in any way or the understanding of what 
the audiences are uh, supposed to be understanding. Yeah. Uh, uh, Abhine, can you drill down just a little bit? I I I I I noticed that you've been you've had a whole series of events. Um, uh, uh, in, that you've organized, or, I, or I've seen some activity around there. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about about those, and you know what, um, you know what, how do those when you're when you're bringing other people together? Um, uh, is, is there an Indian flavor to these algorithms, or you know, if we heard them, would would we would we would we hear any uh, influences from uh, in Indian music, wh whether it's more popular music or classical music or experimental music? Yeah, so uh, we've been doing these uh, series of events called Generative Degenerate. <laughs> it was actually a thing. Uh, I mean, an event that we did in 2019, um, and I thought just let's bring that back because there's a whole bunch of interest around generative AI, and I thought it might be just interesting to uh, tap into some of those people and like show them what generative art is, rather than I just being generative that. AI. Because I, I, I mean, it seems to be the, that every time I get contacted by someone that we want to do a generative media event and they're expecting me to use something like a stable diffusion or a mid journey and just stick it inside a touch designer and oh that's visuals or uh i don't know some sort of generative ai tool essentially uh well i come in or i bring in some people who are literally going writing code in front of them and like uh no this is not what we thought it would be i was like yeah this is what generative arts were well, like before generative AI came in, or whatever the version of generative AI they're calling it. Uh, so I've been finding uh, uh, this approach kind of nice in that every city has its own sort of thing happening. So the first event that we did in the series was in Bombay, and uh, a whole bunch of hardware focused pe people came in uh, who are building their own hardware or helping uh, other companies. So there's a there's a, a brand called uh, Animal Factory Amps, based out of Bombay, that big, uh, initially started building guitar pedals, and they've been getting increasingly into uh, more digital tools. So uh, it was almost like I had most of their lineup of ex employees playing at the event. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but in Delhi, it was completely different. It was uh, more people from the noise music scene. I, I don't know if you guys can hear me properly, or if the yeah, we can. You're fine. Going. Yeah, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah. And now in Bombay, in Bangalore, it's uh, different again because what happened? So the fifth anniversary that we are celebrating now, the first one that we did actually had people from five different make spaces or groups that were working independently on things and were not talking to each other. And suddenly when they arrived at the algorithm, they found out that, oh, you guys are working on similar things that we do. Maybe we can collaborate on that. So I'm hoping something like that happens again. Uh, so I mean, I'm going to find out because we haven't had an algorithm here in like a year. And before that, I mean, the pandemic situation and whatnot, uh everything that we were doing was happening virtually cool nice uh, uh bernie do you want to do you want to jump here and tell in and tell us about what uh, the scene is like and if bernie and claudia what the scene is like in uh in, in australia yeah look um i just hooked um hooked my didgeridoo up to midi mate <laughs> <laughs> um yeah look it's it's a funny scene here um so in 2022 after everything opened up uh after covid i i i'd become so invested and and so interested and and involved um and i i wanted to understand a bit better because the as as renix just alluded to and i didn't, I didn't even realize it went back that far there's 
quite a history of live coding in Australia that I was I was totally unaware of. So I spent, I kind of spent 2022, I called it my year of sharing live coding. So the idea was that I'd run some workshops, I'd play some gigs, I'd try and I'd, I'd really put myself out there. And you know, I have a, I have a full-time job and a family. So it was, it was basically one shot. I had to, I had to spend the year doing it. Apologize to everybody, and then you know, back to normal life after that. Um, so I, I gave it a, I gave it a good hit, and I learned a lot about a lot of things. Um, I met a lot of people. Uh, ben Swift in ANU is doing a lot of stuff. Um, I learned about, uh, I don't remember the name of the language. It's I'm drawing a blank. Um, the language that he tends to use is called EXO or something like that. Ex extempore, right? Extempore, yeah, that's it. Um, so I, I went along and did an algo raid with Ben and and a bunch of his students, and that was that was really great. The problem, the the, the problems that I found because I, I had I had such grand um, ambitions for that year. The problem that I found was that. It was exactly the same problem that I had getting into life coding. You know, I learned about title in 2017, but I simply didn't have capacity time-wise and, and interest-wise to do anything for another three years. So it was only until 2020 that I that I actually got into it. So um that's I, I don't know if that I, I don't know if that's an Australian thing, whether people are really busy here compared to the rest of the world, but what I've found is that. A lot of my workshops I've done have not yielded any immediate success, Claudia being the exception. But what I'm discovering is that having having um, you know having an interest in this, I've I've gone back and got in touch with a whole bunch of people, and um, there is stuff going on. Like like one of my one of my students from early 2022 is going to do a, a visuals thing up at a, a museum locally as a as a visuals um event i guess kind of I, 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 there's australian equivalents um they call it vivid in sydney um but it's it's on a very small scale um so he's he's getting right back into it and i do wonder if um well, i don't know whether that's a cultural thing but it's a thing Bertie, i would say it's not a cultural thing that's my experience from workshops not just in asia but sort of around the world whether it's Asia or Europe, and and I think Alex can probably tell us much more about that because his his involvement in workshops is many times that of mine, and I I'll say that I've experienced the same thing internationally, not not just in 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 our very large region. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I would plus one to that because it's it's on. Uh, I think we were having a conversation earlier about uh, doing workshops and then not hearing from people for a long time. So you don't know whether something has happened with that or not. So, uh, for example, I'm Harmonic, you were talking about influences from the region in terms of the music. Uh, I've actually tried to see if uh, I can get people into just make Bollywood songs, covers with it. So we have done performances just to, uh, I don't know, like I, I'd keep throwing dolls in there or like uh, other Indian percussion in there, or uh, there's uh, there's this one artist called Tiger Babu, who literally does Hindi and uh, Malayalam covers of uh, songs with Sonic Pai. And then I would come in and like do some more Bhangda beats in there. Uh, but I haven't found many, too many people who engage with it right now, or who are trying to perform with these kind of things. Uh, I mean, there's almost like a purist thing that it's trying to be more about rather than take your culture and then present it just in a different tool situation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess in that in that vein, I probably I'm curious from Claudia, what because we did we did a four week workshop. We took a four week break, and then um, students volunteered. Like I, I, I kind of gave them a bit of a shove in the back a bit to um, to do a performance at the because we hosted it at the local art gallery, and we had a performance with three, four students. I think I think it was four students, um, and yeah, from there, Claudia's sort of 
continues. I, I'm curious what, what kept you interested. So I, I see that um, I think we might have different challenges in a way that, that we are regional in Australia. So it might be different if we were in Sydney or Melbourne or, or bigger areas. But I think in, in general, engaging people in regional areas is, is already a challenge. And then you add that on to, you know, maybe it's a niche or a unique thing yeah. because you put a lot of effort into um, in that year. And I see that, you know, <laughs> it's it's such um, an interesting thing that from all that effort that you put into, maybe not, you know, not many people stuck or or it wasn't, you know, big engagement or, or things. But I, I feel like that you're right. Also, people are busy and I can see it on myself too. Um, that um, when, so after the four week, four week work, workshop, um, Bernie challenged us to, to perform uh, in the gallery. And I think that was very motivating because it was like, okay, let's do this. And, and that, that got me into really practicing and looking and, and doing and learning everything and, and your push onto, okay, let's do this. That was that was great and then i feel like every time that there's an event and there's something to do i get all that motivation coming back and when when i feel like oh i don't have time to to play with this i don't have time during the weeks or you know you get busy but then there's a goal to okay now there's going to be something a gig an event or something and then let's let's brush up on everything let's make something new and that that kind of motivates and i'm not sure if um for example not being able to have that um that connection um of raves or something that also has something about that because that would you know get people onto yeah we don't we don't have events forward. here yeah like we, we don't we don't have raves here we don't really have dance clubs here we've got We've got a Pioneer Park Museum, which is where <laughs> our next gig is. Um, yeah. Yeah, that would... Uh, I mean, like when I, when I was in, in the middle of 2022 and I was, I was so gung-ho and I was like, there are spaces that, like there are places that we can go and there are people who are interested in yeah. just getting a sound system into a basement and, and lights and, and projectors yeah. and, and having, a, having a night. But it... Um, yeah, it's hard. It's we just. I think yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be a. It's going to take a few pushes for me to yeah. to bed it in. Um, I'm doing some more workshops um, next term for. Like we're going to target kids um, mm. in uh, like the sort of the ten to ten onwards age group there's a there's a local art space and, and music learning space that are really interested in this sort of thing like really interested in something that, that's very boundary pushing and, and boundary ignoring let's say um, so we're going to give that a crack and and see if we can get some some younger people interested in it and see how that see how that uh, progresses into a lot of people a lot of people in griffith tend to stay in griffith they'll tend to they'll tend to go to school it's a it's a very it's a very agricultural area they tend to go to school uh, schools are pretty good they go to university um, we don't have any universities here so they disappear off to university and they they do that for a few years and and there's just a weird number of people who come back to Griffith um, and so it I, I feel like I feel like this may be a very long game that I'm playing um, and, and maybe given you know eight to ten years we will have a thriving top lap uh, node in, in Griffith, New South Wales. So maybe you have to do live coding of agricultural robots or something, and that's the uh, that's the <laughs> road, you know. You know what? <laughs> now that is an idea. Yeah, that's, that's cause there's I mean it's it's gonna be it's gonna be self-driving tractors, but at the moment a lot of those tractors still require somebody to be sitting on the tractor and they're bored to tears. If they could if they could get spinning lights and robots and stuff going while they're enough, yeah. while they're going up and down the vines. 
<laughs> right. right. My, my brother-in-law has a has one of those remote control, the John Deere's in Texas. And I and I, I think that if you could convince him that he could sit in his home and and live code four tractors at the same time, then he might have real benefits, plus be able to do it from his uh, comfortable air conditioning at home with a with a tall iced tea. And, and that 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 might be a a, a way in. <laughs> I feel I feel like the the embrace there. <laughs> Uh, do you... I was saying drawing uh, crop circles with total graphics and like yes, know, yes. <laughs> it, could oh, be amazing. <laughs> it could be amazing yeah. and yeah. I'm curious I'm curious to know from Gohai about Shanghai because I, I've just uh, done a radio performance in Shanghai and then I played in uh, in uh, Hangzhou but I, I'm not so clear about what's actually going on in uh, in Shanghai and I, and I was surprised to see that you have have ICLC coming so what's what's the what is the the flavor of what's going on there? Yeah, um, so it's it's I think it's something that I think I have a better answer to this in a week's time when after the conference when I've when I've met people and and heard from, and learned from them. Um, kind of like for me, like my kind of like a little bit what 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 I'm sensing right now is that. Um, that China and especially Shanghai, which is an in, in, incredible international city or used to be an inter incredible international city, um, has really, I mean, has quite suffered a lot through COVID and this type of cultural isolationism. Um, so when, when we started doing research on figuring out like what, what communities existed, what like events, um, what, what groups were here, um, we oftentimes found kind of traces of something that existed um, four years ago, um, but which wasn't active at all. Um, we found a lot of people who had like moved abroad um, um, or where just something disappeared. So in, in some way, like I think for, for and I don't want to speak uh, too, too broadly about China because I also know so little about it. Um, but sort of in, in my understanding is that a lot of the cultural life has like uh, shrunk dramatically um and i think especially things that were a little bit more off the beaten path or a little bit more kind of like, um, you know experimental um kind of like, kind of like suffered from 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 that a lot um so th this part of this was kind of like the whole like covid protocols and like um entrance checks and uh, qr codes and all this testing and the inability to fly in on in and out of the country uh restriction with visas right so all of this kind of like definitely um kind of put cold cold water on, on on this development um so that that was one that was one thing so i think like um uh, like from I, I saw a lot of traces of things um uh, but it was hard to like uh, find now um with regards to kind of like the, the the local versus sort of like the international um i feel like from from our conference we primarily i think in terms of the the the, the participants that we're getting um I think we primarily like ended up drawing like people that that were connected or to, to an like international audience or communities of life coding, but maybe who were like more like located in, in that part of the world. Um, so I think like I would I would assume that most of our the people who did apply uh, applied from reading about it in various mailing lists or so that are all international. Um, same as our students. Um, so like. Um, in like uh, I, so I, I teach my employees in NYU Shanghai. Um, this is kind of like a liberal arts institution. The very um, kind of like, uh, that, that, that writes itself as kind of like having this kind of creating young people that are international and have lived abroad, have taken classes abroad. Um, and I think it's the same for us. We have like uh, we like uh, life coding is as a, as a term or as a concept is like really interesting to um, most of our students, I would say. But the ones that have a personal relationship with it, like they they went to Abu Dhabi, they learned it in Abu Dhabi, or they did they they, they took a course um, in New York, um, or they did a summer course in, in Berlin, um, and that, that's why why I like um, how they how they learned learn learned about this, um, and yeah, I mean coming coming back sort of like the. It was only like I would say like in the last couple of weeks that we kind of like got contacted as well after a call for papers and everything. Uh, it was only in the last couple of weeks that we were kind of contacted by very like um, 
uh, individuals that were like very keen on attending. Um, and I actually, I actually think that probably maybe like some of these uh, folks uh, maybe will kind of share about like their communities or but, like in, in some way, I think they, they might have learned. I mean, we tried our best to kind of like publicize this, but they might have learned about uh, kind of like this also like a little bit too late um, to actively participate. But we, we do have some sort of an open session where people um, can, can just plug in and play or, or discuss. Um, so yeah, yeah, kind of curious about curious about that. Well, I know that James Harkins has been in Guangzhou, and he has been doing super colliding uh, for a very long time. Yeah. And he came to Tokyo to perform, and I know that there's a few people in in Beijing as well. I'm curious, yeah. like, I mean, China is so vast, and India has the same right. the same sort of situation. That it might even be the case that there are there are specific city scenes that may be totally unconnected to cities and scenes in other parts of the country. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, Hangzhou that you mentioned, I think like the, the Chinese Academy of Art is definitely, it seems to be a hub for this type of experimentation. Um, so we have some, uh, we have some participants, like quite a few participants, also like students who are joining us uh, from Hangzhou specifically. But, to, but to, to in, in fairness of disclosure, Hangzhou is about the only dance floor in the world that I've absolutely totally cleared. <laughs> yep, yep. That's what the 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 kind of sounds that we can tend to create, uh, and it associating with uh, noise music so much. Uh, I mean, that's the only connect that I found. Like, if, as soon as you dip it, sell it, almost as a oh, this is a noise music event. People are more interested, or uh, if it's not, uh, I've had a harder time convincing people that okay, this is stuff that you can dance to rather than or oh, sit there, chin strokey, and like just nod your head. Uh, I mean, the first event that we did in the series, I had to literally tell people, This is not an algo sit down, this is an algo, please get up. <laughs> yeah, I've had the same experience, really. Um... And I, I guess that's why we came up with the name Algrave to try and get people interested in the idea that you could make music for people to dance to, which is something which I've been enjoying doing since around the year 2000. But <clears throat> it wasn't really a community of practice. Um, and even when we came up with the name in 2012, um, live coding just existed within the scene um, in London, um, uh, people would tell different stories from other, like there was also scenes in the States and in uh, Germany. But from my perspective, it was really in this sort of free open source software scene called Open Lab in London, where people were just doing all kinds of strange noise music experiments. Um, uh, but to get people interested in the idea of dancing to it, um, was a whole thing <laughs> and it involved coming up with this name for something which didn't exist um, and trying to encourage people like people like Shelley Knotts who are sort of doing intense noise performances to just add some time quantization so that people could dance to it um, and people like Thor Magnuson and really not interested in making dance music at all but just getting, putting these events on, inviting people to play, and he came up with some like Ixi Lang, which was quite influential at the time. Um, so yeah, it's a strange kind of trying to imagine something into existence, and it felt at the start felt very much like an internet-based culture because just a few people in each place. Um, and the actual live coding scene was really in in the form of a, ma a mailing list, live code mailing list, and Top Lap existed as a way to. Yeah, just a really DIY platform for people to exchange ideas and imagine what could happen. Um, so yeah, around the year 2012, came up with this name, Algrave, trying to make it real. Um, but then realised that actually there were these people in Mexico who'd kind of picked up the idea of live coding and turned it into a real culture. <laughs> well, kind of people in Europe, sort of trying to make it real and sort of getting interviewed in magazines and things, uh, which just mean that people, Mexico, 
in Mexico City in particular who'd maybe traveled to, or stayed in Europe and picked up the idea would bring it back um, and kind of put it into practice really but not quite realizing I think that it wasn't quite a real thing in Europe <laughs> um, in the States it's sort of um, um, and I think for them what was key is having both time and, and space like um, making any scene it's important to have a space where people come and meet each other on a regular basis and they'd have these workshops and develop these practices um, where they'd do this um, Mexican style live coding where they just perform for nine minutes at a time um, for, from scratch um, so yeah um, so yeah I think from the perspective of trying to make a scene you have to try and get across the idea that it already exists <laughs> which is a tricky one um, and find time and space for people to meet each other and make it exist um, and yeah it's, it's a bit of a tricky balancing act uh, I think we need to Frank, I think you're right. yes, sorry I wanted to pick up that point about space because I think it's very relevant particularly in Asia um, that it, actually the space is one of the most difficult problems i mean in japan it's nice that there is some there is some art uh, experimental art culture so there were some small spaces um so it was less of a problem but still you know real estate and and getting a space is very difficult the spaces can be very expensive in taiwan being a small island then the space is uh, another very difficult constraint just now I, I haven't been here in vietnam long but it does seem like the access to spaces is also quite constrained so i'm I'm curious to know. And then, of course, then that connects to economics. Um, and so I'm curious to know about people's experience related to spaces and economics in other parts of our region. Yeah, I mean, the same case with India. Uh, Bombay, I think uh, I find it more open minded, which is why I think the first couple of Falbraves happened in Bombay. Uh, both in terms of the th the way the city thinks in, uh, about art. So, I mean, art can be enjoyable. It doesn't have to be chin strokey and oh, that's all we do with it. Um, whereas everywhere else, um, it's more, everyone's almost approaching it like a classical music performance of any kind, whether it's uh, Western classical or it's a Hindustani concert that's happening. So, uh, I mean, people are very much naturally come and there'll be like a floor seating happening and they'll just come and sit down. Like if there's like a Hindustani concert, that's going to go start. Uh, and here I'm trying to see, okay, I'm, I'm playing drum and bass. I'm, I'm playing almost break core. BPMs are fairly high, space music happening, there's big speakers. I think you can move to this. I think you can try to get up. I mean, you would see some of the heads nodding, but also I think most people are trying to sound more serious. Uh, so then it goes back to that angle of, oh, we have to sit down, be proper, and <laughs> not make too much noise. Um, in fact, the first performance that we did in, uh, in Bombay was I mean the uh, people who contacted me uh, on uh, on socials that can we come in in the middle of the performance is that all right I'm like this is a party come in man like it's it's supposed to be that that feel like coming in whenever you want and leave whenever you want uh, which is why in Bangalore we're doing it literally as a house party that okay we'll have our RSVP list and try to find out if you're safe enough to be in here uh, and because this is literally someone's house um but then do whatever you want alex did you see a um like did you see any sort of a transition from people curious about what was going on and and like specifically not dancing and paying attention to actually because i've seen some like some of the footage from and photos from your early stuff is is crazy um it looks like people are going nuts so did you was there a gap there um yeah i don't yeah i don't think so i, I guess it just depends where you're playing like if you're just in a 
club lineup and you're not even projecting your screen, then you can enjoy people um, not paying attention to the screen. But I think in general, you just have a shape to the night where you put um, more strange music on at the start and people get used to the idea of the screens. If they're not used to them yet. Um, but yeah, I guess the more events I've done in Sheffield in particular, more people have been used to the idea and just don't stand in rows staring at the code. <laughs> but yeah, there's definitely an, um, a phenomenon of looking up and seeing people just stood in a line, just transfixed, trying to work out what's going on. Um, I think that does fade and it also fades through the night towards the end. People, if they've drunk a bit more, um, sort of, yeah, stop paying attention. Um, I think something that's really important think... is a um, smoke machine um, because then everything <laughs> becomes a bit harder to see. People feel less self-conscious. Um, otherwise, especially with projections, it can be quite bright. <laughs> and it can, like, kill the vibe. So, um, yeah, that, that can be quite a nice technology to make use of. I wonder if it's to do with just Sheffield being more open-minded with what classifies as dance music. <laughs> I mean, the kind of sounds that have come out other than live coding itself has been dance music, but with more experimental sounds, I suppose. I don't know. No, I, th I think Tokyo and London and Sheffield, especially Sheffield, all have that that cultural history that, that helps things along, right? Yeah, it's definitely nice to connect with your local culture in different ways. Um, but you don't have to just put on live coding events. You can put events that have DJs on and sort of collaborate with existing nights and sort of mix things up that way. Yeah, that's why I think we need more Bhangra beats happening with live coding. So, yeah. Always like your Bunda beats in the weekend jams. <laughs> One one of the interesting things I that that I've experienced in these uh, these, these big you know mega streams you know twenty four hour live, live live streams is that the the range of musical styles that comes comes out is really extraordinary and, and you know I think it's the only thing I can think of where you get people who are doing dance type of beats or techno or noise. And alongside experimental things, or you know, people doing more um, things that might have a home in a, in a more academic kind of culture, um, uh, uh, and, and it's just really kind of an extraordinary thing about the live coding um, uh, domain is it seems to uh, you know you know and you know you know, encourage this kind of cross feeding across different um, different traditions and disciplines. I'd, I'd like, I'd, I mean, I'd call that un, unopinionated as a tool for the most part. Um, I was talking with, with Claudia just before. Now, um, her, her background is Hungarian, and we were having a discussion about how much uh, languages in, um, you know, languages in code reflect, you know, your, your spoken language or your written language and how influential they are and i mean i guess at the end of the day it's probably I, i'm a i'm a I speak one language and it's probably hard for me to imagine that there could be any other way to do things um but now i'm you know i'm watching title v2 get written and it's got all this stepwise stuff as opposed to you know just cyclic stuff and it's like ah i brain doesn't really understand and you know I'm, I'm sure that's got a large part to do with my my language center um totally lost my thread there but anyway that's my comment for whatever that came before that <laughs> it's, it's probably not an exaggeration though so to say that language probably does influence how how this kind of culture spreads right i mean if a lot of the stuff is written in english then it is going to pose a certain barrier to people i mean i experienced that in in everywhere that I've been in Asia, that that sometimes it's a matter of having documentation in other languages, and when it's present, that's going to be much more likely to draw somebody from another uh, language background in, right? 
Yeah, totally. Um, which makes me wonder because Tidal seems to be quite popular in Japan. Like there are, there's a fairly significant group there. So that's interesting. The other interesting one is that um, something like Orca, which is totally not like, like it's only got an alphabet set. It doesn't it doesn't have any any specific language associated with the way it codes. Um, I do wonder how I, I don't actually know. I do wonder how popular that is in in non English speaking countries. Uh, Alex, maybe you could pick up that thread. I mean, you you know, you know, title does seem to have spread you know you know quite widely in the in the live coding community um uh, uh you know what what's your observation been on about how, how, what what's led to that spread why has that been uh, uh you know adopted uh you know so so widely uh you know globally um i don't really know um it's so difficult to install um it's it's quite <laughs> a strange language even the language it's based on haskell is really niche um so yeah i'm probably the worst person to ask <laughs> oh it's 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 down to it's down to a lot of hardcore evangelism on alex's part plus his uh <laughs> plus his uh pretty impressive performances and then some other people that managed to get equally impressive but different results from alex at the same time and i think that that's that does a lot for that does a lot for selling the tool right so um yeah i guess people like kindom who picked it up early and sort of that's right. did really nice things with it yeah that's right and, and then in japan's case i mean you so, so kubota sensei who i mentioned was on that early top lap cd even he is doing experiments in title i mean there's a there's a number of people uh, some senior people at uh, namoto san is another uh who use title for performances and so when you have people doing that then like a you know, other people can see here's a path and then they are, you know, it's a little bit less scary. So having having those examples, I think, encourages people to 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 follow. Right. And and, and I think partly, though, it does speak just to the, the usefulness of the tool, despite the I, I've also struggled with helping people get title installed in workshops. So I know that I know the pain of that. But but once they get go, once they have it installed, then it actually isn't so difficult to at least make some kind of noise uh, that's sort of interesting, whereas I think Super Collider, on the other hand, despite it being an older tool than Tidal, is in in some ways not so well suited to instantly making something that's that's kind of satisfying, right? And so that discourages people from, to some extent, from from pursuing it further or or from trying to use it in a in a live coding perspective. Although that doesn't stop some people. I mean, you know, Shelley and Joanne do a great job with it, and as do many others. So it, it's it's not a a complete obstacle, but but I think that's one of the reasons that title itself is particularly successful. Yeah, it's been interesting. Uh, this is something I always... for... Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. This is something I keep uh, uh, repeating in every uh, every workshop that I do. Uh, is uh, there's a the artist called uh, Jason Levine. He I think goes by the name Zululu. Uh, he once described title to me as the most amount of coherent noise per character. So you can have fairly coherent beats and like people uh, that they, people can understand with the least amount of characters. Uh, so you can quickly get a beat going, essentially. And that's what most people are trying to do, <laughs> to try to get people to dance, essentially. Yeah, I think a lot of that's due to the mini notation, which is actually heavily influenced by the bold processor. Um, which is originally a system for notating tablet drums. Talk so more about that. Yeah, it's uh, uh, cool. tell us more about what 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 that connection is. Um, yeah, just this system, the Bowl processor by Bernard Bell. Um, he um, went to India to do a project notating tabla rhythms. Um, so percussion um in north indian percussion um it's a beautiful language he's still developing it um so check out the bold processor version three um but yeah the the whole idea of cycles and tidal and the mini notation is is really uh close to the bold processor um so there's a very beautiful connection between Bold Processor, Delhi, and Bombay. 
uh, because uh, Jim uh, Kippen was based out of Bombay in NCPA, and uh, Bernard was, uh, uh, I think, working with something called Istar, which I tried looking up so much and I couldn't find specific, like other people working there. But turns out uh, that there's a, a, so NCPA is a very prestigious performance space in Bombay. Uh, and uh, the person who founded that is this person called Jamshed J. Baba, whose older brother actually was a nuclear scientist. Uh, JJ Baba has done like a whole bunch of uh, very cool things for Indian art and presenting Indian art in uh, spaces. Uh, so it turns out there was a collaboration between these two institutions happening in two completely different cities. And what JJ Baba wanted to do was um, make some sort of notation system for Hindustani and Carnatic systems. And Bold Processor was the easiest connect there. And so a bunch of funding went that way, um, at least from the Indian context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we uh, did cover a lot of this at, as part of our first tool uh, workshop that we did in Delhi, which kind of, uh, I think we spent more time talking about all of this stuff than the actual <laughs> language. But the whole idea with live coding I find is much better if people pick it up and then experiment by themselves. Yeah, so Claudia, how's the experience of learning live coding? Have you been looking around, trying different languages? Um, do you feel connected with the scene? Um, it's very interesting for me. I think, I, I don't know where others come from, but for me, I'm not coming from knowing coding, uh, from before, so I do visual arts in other ways, and um, and it was very interesting to to learn all this, and I was very curious about it. Um, and why you how you were saying that it's got so like a wide variety of genres or, or ways to to do, and that was that was a great thing because at first I I only heard certain white music and I thought okay well it's great but it might not be something that I would be close to and then and then Ben made the point to to tell us on, on the workshop that you know and, and we saw examples of how it can be whatever you want it to be um, and that that made it more approachable I think um, um, as you were saying like from Indian music to to you know typical noise or, or whatever music that whatever you want it to be, um, I don't I found it quite logical. I think the language, even though I, I'm not coming from a coding background, but I also find it easy to learn languages. Um, so I think that relates to to that and the more I think languages I speak that might also help to learn the coding language too. So it's it's just another way of talking. So I found um, um, punctual mini title quite easy to to understand. It was more I think the the possibilities are daunting, like how many things you can do with it and <laughs> trying everything out. But um, no, the programs. I'm recalling yeah. I'm recalling a little performance <laughs> from the from the the sort of showcase gig we did. Um, and what you did was very much a visual, like I think I think most of your focus was on the visuals, but you provided a soundtrack to the visuals. So it was almost <laughs> like I wouldn't say you're playing music, but you were you were expanding the the, the yeah. sensory part of your of your visual performance, which was which is great. Like that it, yeah. was, it was I I was um I was flabbergasted out of the there were there were four performers, three of them did audio and visual solo like they, they did both both languages on their own solo and then um yeah there was only one guy who was who was um a little a little more nervous and he he ended up doing visuals while i did the audio um but it blew my mind like i couldn't couldn't imagine putting myself out there like that after such a short time even though i was <laughs> you know i was playing it one the whole time 
Yeah, I think that helps because you're like, no, you can totally do it. <laughs> and now you're talking about it like this. And yeah, well, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. um, quite a, like, there was about 30 people, I think, who came along to watch. Yeah. Too. Like, that's possibly the biggest crowd I've played to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, that was great. I think um, it would be, I, I try to, to bring it to, like, friends and, and you know, when they, we have something going on and, and bring that to to show them. I think I personally might have the trouble of like the technical setting up and that part, which helps when we we work together, so that I don't have to worry about that part. Yeah. Um, I I that's don't just practice, I guess. Yeah, I was talking to Abane before the before the thing, and and like I, I feel like there's there's three groups of of people broadly speaking who, who like to live code and there's there's artists who don't care about how the tool works there's um there's the artists who who have some some artistry and some technical knowledge and they sort of just use the tool and then there's the guys who may have some artistry but are very much more interested in the tool itself mm -hmm. um yeah. oh, see you Abine. good luck we'll catch you later on yeah, Ebene, thanks for joining. And and just before you leave, just say a few words about uh, uh, you know later later today you're you you've got a group session. What's gonna what it what uh, what's gonna happen? Uh, yeah, so uh, we're gonna actually do it in the most distributed way possible. Uh, so our uh, algorithm starts in just about two hours. The first performance is actually happening. Uh, it's a remote performance in, happening in S3 with one performer in New Delhi, another one in Tokyo uh, doing visuals. Uh, after that, we have another person called the uh, Ear Drummer Man, Manaswi. He's actually sitting in MIT, so he's going to do some rave models and all of that. Uh, and we have someone called Mira Sundar, who's going to be doing a violin, Hindustani and Carnatic violin mixed with Sonic Pi. Uh, very excited wow. to hear her. I've been trying to get her on for almost two years now. Um, and a whole bunch of people who have literally never life coded in front of people. So yeah, this is gonna be an interesting one. Sounds wild. Great. Yeah, we look forward yeah, to that. That'll be that that that'll be really fun. Thank thanks. Thanks so much for joining and for organizing that. Uh, yeah. All right. What? Thanks so much. See you guys. Thanks. So I think the um yeah, the, the, the point that I was trying to make is that um, I think with the three groups of people, you find that the people who are, who are very much focused on the artistry um, somehow feel like they should know more about the tool when they're trying to explain it to people. But if, yeah. I think it's important to understand that, yeah. th that there is a market for, for people who don't actually care beyond that point, that there is a tool they can do art with. They will just do art with it and, and, not, and, not, and not care about the technical. So it's actually important when you're when you're doing this to sort of maybe have a have a bit of knowledge about your like don't don't what's sort of like don't don't feel like you should know more it's really mm -hmm. important that you know more depending on the category you fall in and you okay. will appeal to somebody depending on the category you fall in like like it will appeal more to somebody if you don't give them the technical details potentially yeah that's i think it's the thing i mean um i see a lot of people who in it uh very much interested in the tool too and i feel a little bit like oh i'm i'm not you know i'm, I'm not that into like understanding that um maybe i'm you know maybe i'm, I'm i can't or i shouldn't or i'm trying to be part of and, and using it for art and i've got ideas what i want to achieve it's just a bit harder to <laughs> achieve it when you when you're trying to to learn and, and find out how to and then I think that's a, a bit of a um, probably possibly a breaking barrier for people um, that they think um, as I can see it in myself, like, okay, if I'm not up to that technical knowledge, maybe I shouldn't be doing this because. I, I hope that people don't get, I hope that people don't get that impression. I think that's one of the nice things about one of the nice things about titles. I think there's plenty of people that are using title that have some idea about how title works, but they have very little understanding about how Haskell, the language itself, works. 
I think it's the same for Hydra. When I when I teach Hydra, I think there's people that they 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 sort of get okay. I put this chunk with this chunk, and I can get something on the screen. But then they don't really understand the JavaScript underneath that's making it all work. And not not to say that there's not a lot of payoff from learning those things, but they're certainly not they're not necessary for at least at least some level. I mean, being able to as you said, being able to produce art with the tools. So, and I think we don't want to, I mean, personally, I do want to encourage people to look into the tools. I think that getting some algorithmic literacy is is part of the benefit of the tools, but absolutely it's not required to make art with them. I think, uh, Alex, I think you probably have a lot to say about that. Yeah, just to agree really. Um, and as a live coder, I think the part of the practice is to try and um, put yourself in the position of learning um, even when you've been working with the um, environment for a long time. Um, I think that's what keeps it exciting. Um, and part of using a live coding environment, I think, is sort of finding your own creative constraints within it, because um, a general purpose programming language um, doesn't really have any constraints and that you can do absolutely anything with it, um, or at least something a computer can um and so you as part of developing your practice i think is sort of finding a small part of it to explore um even if you're just choosing a few functions that you really like and want to as part of your preparation for performance you might sort of pick a few like two or three functions to explore during that performance um see how they work together um so yeah it, it's totally about limits i think finding your own limits to work within and push against um and that is very different from the idea of being a sort of all-knowing superhuman who <laughs> um, is sort of creating whole new algorithms on the fly rather than just sort of exploring patterns and how they work together which i think is a much more humble position um and in the end comes up with better results really um i think as a performer it's important not to get too carried away with trying to do clever complex things which um i think that's part of the problem with projecting is that you get the impression that maybe you are supposed to be impressive but i think really it's much more about just being expressive and just uh, sharing the expression of musical ideas with people Talk, talk talk about how this translates to working uh, collaboratively. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, all, all of you, you know, work in, um, you know, together with others, whether it's, you know, news, audio and visuals or, or something, you know, like Estuary where you were, you know, can, can perform together with other, you know, live coding. And I think, I think that's becoming very, very, more more common um but 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 uh talk 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 a little bit about that um i might just dive in quickly um if that's all right i've so i've been i've been doing the uh, th4 and crashing booth and myself started a just a an agreement to to show up at the same time once a week um, about three and a half years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. Um, it's been quite a long time though, but we, um, we, we dived in and, and started just, just like it was totally from scratch improvisation together. There were no, there were no ideas generally discussed beforehand. Sometimes we'd say, well, let's do a dumb time signature. Um, and that was about it. And I've I've kept that going. TH4 and Crashing Booth have both um, that they haven't had um, time or capacity to to continue. So I've tried to keep it going, um, and I've hit the point where I can't really commit that time. But Joan Querrell has um, has taken that over for me and, and is backing me up there, which has been great. Um, and I see it. I, I love it. I think it's so important. I find that there's certain players who come along and they're like a muse for me, and I think that the next frontier for life coding is not just doing it yourself and particularly whether it's for for, for pure audio or for audio and visuals um i think i think the next 
the next big area for that is is the collaboration and that's where uh, it's like kind of following the musical um and i think people are collaborating but it's it's still i mean it's very much in a performance sense it's still very much a solo thing and i'm guilty of that i'm going to be playing solo tomorrow so um but oh no i'm i'm, I'm doing a weekend jam we, we have taken a slot for the weekend jam so i will be jamming with someone tomorrow um as well so i don't know i'm, I'm curious what other people think about this but for me I, I think collaboration is 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 like a massive area still to be explored Alex yeah. or Rennick, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, so, so to, to continue on collaboration, I'm eager to collaborate with other people in Southeast Asia where I am located now. And so if uh, there are people that are watching this that are located somewhere in Southeast Asia, Thailand or, uh, or uh, Vietnam or Singapore, Philippines, elsewhere, I hope that they can get in touch because I'm eager to make those connections and collaborations with, with those with those people and i want to mention that there's something coming up in uh in early june in bangkok there'll be a an event and i think some of the people that are attending iclc are going to be making their way from iclc to bangkok to perform and so maybe we also want to hear more about the upcoming iclc in shanghai yeah that's a good uh thank you Renick. Uh, you know go high if you could um you know you you've you done a sales pitch a terrific job of putting the conference together maybe just talk about what that's been like and how you've ended up representing the you know what what uh, what what aspect of this is 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 local and represents the you know the the you know this part of the world versus you know what part of it is is just you know global people coming from all over yeah um so i would say it's like in in all respects it's been a, a quite a, a learning experience um we, I mean, part of it is is because I think China has some very unique um, challenges in, in in organizing something and in doing something in the in in in, in engaging the public in in, in some sense. Um, we so like uh, ICLC, ICLC will use three different venues. Um, so this is first the the university uh, NYU Shanghai. In in some sense, this is the most the space where we have the most control over, um, right? We have full academic freedom within the university. Um, you know, this is um, unfettered internet. Um, it's very easy to make things happen within the university. Um, but we didn't want to kind of stay kind of in this 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 ivory tower in this in this um, in this constrained space. We wanted to kind of also go into the city. Um, also physically, like um, the university is, is in Pudong, uh, which is uh, one one part of Shanghai, but kind of the more culturally interesting space is probably Pushi. Um, so we have, uh, we do two, we, we will have one event at the Shanghai Concert Hall. Um, so this will be one evening of, um, yeah, one evening of concerts at Shanghai Concert Hall. Uh, which was very interesting to to organize. Um, it took the, the everyone from kind of like legal counsel to chief financial officers of the university to like uh, months of contract negotiations and figuring out if you need to have actually need to hold a license um, in order to do that um, in China. Also, like if you do perform traditionally, right. You have to submit um, kind of like scripts um, or lyrics um, to a sort of a review body um, that will review this. Like, how do you how do you do this with, with live coding? Um, so there are a lot of things kind of like that, that kind of like we we learn and we figured out how to kind of like um, how to make happen. And then I just want to mention the the third venue is a system kind of like um, kind of like an, an alternative space. Uh, that exists and is very um, alive and well, um, and we have basically the algorithm at, at, at system, um, which um, yeah. So it's, it's it's basically three days. Um, we start with an opening concert, um, then we have we have two keynotes. Um, we have a lunch concert. Uh, we have uh, paper presentations. Um, two afternoons of uh, of workshops um including really interesting augmented reality like a very low more like local augmented reality experimentation with, with live coding um and then the two the, the two evenings of, of concerts um and yeah i mean go high we're gonna we're mm -hmm. gonna get booted Wrap off up. the uh yeah. 
So uh, thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Uh, it's been a lovely conversation. Uh, it's been been a you know it's been very very engaging. I really appreciate everybody's um, coming in and sharing their thoughts. Thanks for organizing High Harmonics. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. For being yeah. Really fun. Thanks That's again. Fun. Thanks for putting the whole thing together. Yeah. And, I think and, we're and, off already. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's all good. We're sorry, I just, just the stream, the stream gave up. Um, so we're all good. No, um, sorry, uh, hi harmonics. I wanted to say thank you as well. I, I, you've put a lot of work into this. I apologise. I haven't been able to. I've, I've committed as much time as I could, but I really don't feel like I've done very much. But um, no, yeah. I appreciate I appreciate all that you've done, you Bernie. It's it's always good to have somebody else to. Uh, uh, you know, bounce ideas off of or to, you know, to help, help, help out. Um, but, but th this was a great conversation. We, we touched a lot of, a lot, a lot of ground. I really, uh, I, I brought a lot, lot, lot of notes. I loved, uh, Claudia, you said that writing, you know, languages, uh, learning language is another way of talking. And that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that's an idea that, that is, uh, kind of sticking with me. Uh, um, um, and 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 there's some 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 wonderful uh conversation about about the you know regional versus global and you know Randick, you you shared, shared I, I i i'm really impressed with the um you know your, your your range of experience and you know your your knowledge of the various communities and what's going on there and your ability to share it with us that was that that, that was really wonderful um i, I wish i wish that i had managed to get more of the those those people involved so that's my that was my uh failing this time i, I should have, it would have been much better if i if somebody from each of those places had been here so sorry about that no yeah. that's not your fault <laughs> you <laughs> gave them the opportunity and, and if they couldn't make it they couldn't make it it's okay um yeah look i was gonna say if you ever want to collaborate with someone in south south southeast asia right? yeah well no ab absolutely because because i've now that i'm now that I'm, I'm at rmit then i already got to I'm, I'm sort of in the process of of working out how to get down to melbourne to uh to be involved with them in some events and so if i'm there and, and you know you've got the because as we as you're saying there's this history in australia it's uh the two andrews and ben right the three of them um and and uh, uh, Ben Carey was Ben Carey is I think much more into modular stuff now, but he was doing some live Max MSP stuff as well before I think. And so th there's people I, I know there's people that are th there is a pretty big scene. If once you're outside of just Griffith where you are, I think I, I don't know how big, but I mean there are people sort of all over Australia that are they're involved in it, yeah. But that, um, you know what that actually comes down to a regional problem in that the. No worries. Okay, thanks. Go Good luck. No worries. Jaya, Jaya, Jaya. Jaya. Get chat for a little. Um, uh, it's, it's it's a regional problem in that Australia is a very a very spread out country. Um, yeah. So you've just you've just talked about three people from from Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's that's you know it's literally the 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 large part of the east coast. They're separated by by. Uh, what are we talking like two thousand kilometers apart yeah there's real cost in taking uh driving or taking an airplane right yeah absolutely so yeah. it's yeah it's it's interesting i i yeah i, I very much the yeah the, the 2022 I'd, I'd just burned out at the end of the year i i I'd pushed really hard i got a lot of contacts i met a lot of people but i, I mm -hmm just didn't have I didn't have the energy or the space to follow through and, and try and start coagulating the group again because it feels like people have probably tried and probably just happened the same as I did they just it, it got hard and and they had other other commitments but through, but, but through each of these each of these rounds of effort and probably Alex has been through enough iterations of this to see the the payoff is that each each time probably feels a bit like that but you you add to the head count by by a few each time and then at some point those things start to be self-perpetuating is that right Alex yeah um I, I guess the key thing is finding organizers um uh to keep it going because if there's like two or three organizers you can sort of take turns taking the lead on organizing events um and yeah other people just show up <laughs> um, yeah and once you build up a mailing list of people it gets easier um because you don't have to rely on social media as a conduit um but yeah when in sheffield sometimes it's been hard when 
Um, it's just felt like it's just me organizing things because Lucy's been busy, but lately um, someone called Ray has moved here over the last couple of years and we've, it means we've had this group of three people who are just keeping things going. Um, and when you haven't got energy to do it, then there's one else to, to lean upon. So I think, or, yeah, organizers are probably the most important thing, um, but also finding people who are up for doing that work um, is difficult. It's like you really have to treasure those people. <laughs> it, is, it is really hard work and um, you have to feel compelled to do it because it can be really exhausting. Um, so yeah. it can feel like a kind of an addiction almost sort of feeling the need to do these things. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's totally true of um of the online space as well. Like you know, organising these sorts of events, you need you need people to lean on. And I know I think you sort of took most of it on. The first, uh, like the first two I did, there was one in there was one in twenty twenty August twenty twenty, and I think there was an early one early twenty twenty one. There was another like Algo Red live stream thing, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I yeah, think I you were most of the organisation and. Like at some point, I was sitting there realizing that nobody was stepping up. It was like yeah. all this work, and I was like, "Well, I feel like it's not going to." Yeah, that's the problem. Very long you can get used to doing the work, and that can actually stop other people from getting involved. So yeah, um, yeah, it's a bit, I'm sort of jealous of people in the Netherlands because geographically. Um, there's all these cities with amazing links together and they, they've just managed to get together this really sort of collaborative group of people doing things um, and they can get to each other's events and then get home the same day and that kind of thing <laughs> by, by amazing train network. Um, mm. uh, and yeah, they, I guess they started out with this collaborative feel. It's quite hard to go from being this kind of um, organiser, sort of janitorial figure uh, behind the scenes making things happen because people get really used to it and they, there's just no path for to them taking on part of the load to kind of exclude people from getting involved with the organization so yeah um, and that's the cool thing that's the cool thing about this online stuff i mean not not to mention the environmental considerations and i know alex you've been concerned about that increasingly i mean i i, I think about it just because of the attention you draw to it i think more about like in the justification of buying a plane ticket from here to uh, Europe and flying about Europe playing events, right? Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a cost to that beyond just the money, right? It's a there's a there's a moral cost to yeah. it. Yeah, um, yeah. Although if you're a musician flying to play to two hundred people, that's better than doing an event always in the same place and having people fly to you. Um, well. Well, right, and and, 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 any, and any of these is much better than a, than a military sending you know a battalion of tanks somewhere, right? So that's a much greater yeah. environmental cost, right? So I, I don't want to take all the burden on us, but but that said, I mean, that maybe there is a way, maybe there is a way to do it online more. And uh, I, I, I harmonize you're doing a good job of this, but we can develop more online community and and sharing this way. I mean, COVID is the other thing. I think with COVID, the that actually damaged live events so badly. Um, everywhere and so and and i think some people still didn't even go back after that right so maybe there is a yeah hmm, there's a way to get get more online although since covid in my personal chaos i haven't even really been a very proper like a uh, participant in in what's happened online since yeah i think people kind of got a bit bored of all the online events um because a lot mm. of them were like in-person events which had been moved online which never really worked and just ended up being mm. just bad events and, so, that, well, so that's that's what i wonder i, I mean I, mm. I i wonder what does it take to what, what does it take to make an online event work to how to how do you capture more of the spirit oh, we, i think we haven't found that yet I but that, that's it see that like i think we're going to see that in about two hours in india right <laughs> <laughs> Right. That, that, that's that, that's my thought. Like I, I see mm. when, when you run these events, and um, you know Alex in particular does this quite frequently. Is that there's always a physical event. There's always some people come to. They, they either go and go and camp at a stream, or they um, or they have a you know a, a bit of a party at their house. Mm. Um, these are 
like I think I think that's a way to do it is that you you create small house party notes and you have to yeah. perform at that little house party as well. So Bernie, if that's something that you want to do, I mean, since one of the other problems is time zone. So for me to do that with Alex, there's a certain amount of challenge. But for you and me yeah. to do that, there's there's just a few hours difference, right? So maybe we uh we can take advantage of our three hour gap and our two hour gap, whatever it is, and uh, and try to do more of that, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. yeah in the old days, there's uh, the placard headphone festivals um, in Paris and Tokyo. Mm. And they got around it just by having 48 hour non stop events, um, <laughs> each in each place having two rooms, one with the other um, performances from the other place. <laughs> so mm. you could move between one city and the other with mm. your headphones um, and fall asleep listening to the music. Mm. And yeah, I think 24 hour events, which is, I guess is what we do with these streams, is mm. one answer. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's always a problem with having to sleep at night. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. You've, um, you've got me thinking, right? Because um, one, one of the things that I was that I was quite interested in trying to develop was a was a top lap Australia note um, during 2022. Well, that was part of my that was part of my my trying to network with people. And I don't I don't think it's something that will take off. I, I bought the domain and everything. Um, is there, I was looking. I was just I was just looking at nodes. What else? What do you know about? Uh, I haven't talked with so I haven't talked with Andrew or Andrew in 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 a long time. Now I'm realizing. Um, ben, I I talked to very briefly. What What do you know about anything else in Australia? There, there is no there is no node as far as I know. There's like there's groups oh. of people. But maybe, mm. like, maybe at this point in time, that uh, Top Lab Australia is a is a bit of a pipe dream. But do we have any representation in Southeast Asia in Top Lab? Do we have any Japan? Oh, there's a ja there is a there is a Japan node. Um, I, my I was just looking at the Twitter account earlier, and the and the last posts are things that I did um, in 2021. So people aren't. I'm I'm not and and because I'm not there, it's a little hard for me to know exactly what's going on. Like COVID was pretty chaotic for me. Um, in Southeast Asia, so there, there there's a group of people around this venue called Synap Home Lab. A guy called Ryan has set up a community space, and I, I played there uh, a few weeks back. And so he's trying to uh, to boot up a kind of community in uh, in Bangkok for for live coding and creative coding and that kind of thing. And he's have he's got a good start. So, the, so there's that going, and I'll go. I'll go back next week or in a couple of weeks to uh, to play an event that's related to that to that scene. Um, in Vietnam, I, like I say, I think there's nothing. There's just the this one VJ studio that's done uh, this bit of uh, hydro workshops taught by that one guy from from Thailand. Um, in the Philippines, I haven't heard of anybody yet. And there's what uh, Alex, uh, how do we pronounce his name? The guy in in Jakarta. There's one one guy in Indonesia right. using tidal cycles, right? Ranga, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, who, who have yeah, I've yet to meet, so I don't know how. The, he's somebody I, I, I'd actually like to have heard from because I don't know how. Is it is it just him, or are there how many people are doing, are, are even aware of it? I think there? he's got a bit of a scene going there. Yeah, they seem to be doing really interesting kind of locally focused events. Um, okay. But yeah, yeah we, guess, we, um, we we tried to get him. Uh, you know, involved in this uh, th this event, and then but but he got sick and was ha had uh, kind of drop drop out, unfortunately. But I, I, I know he's got a he's got a group of people that he works with, and um, there was there was someone that helped organize uh, some some live coding uh, gamelan style, um, uh, you know, kind of collaboration. Uh, someone in Scott, what Alex, you know him, right? You know what I'm talking about. His name slips Ted, my mind Ted right the now. Trumpet. Yes, Ted the Trumpet. Yes. Um, yeah, amazing project. Really nice. Yeah. Um, incredible vocalist. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely stuff happening there. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd, have you tried just making a Telegram channel for Al Grave or like Top Lap Australia and seeing? You can get people to join and see if it can be a bit self-organizing yeah but i mean that's uh, that's kind of the plan at some point you need to uh, like I, I have to commit to being able to organize other stuff beyond that and uh yeah, I, yeah. 
so it was a no-go for that. I'm, I'm really only just getting back into the swing of things now. And this is, yeah, just mm -hmm. trying to uh, eke out some time in my life for it because I, I, you know, I enjoy it so much. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd love to see if there's some way to make the, uh, uh, you know, the, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about the, um, you know, what you can do on, on, online, the benefits that, that, that come with that. I, uh, I, 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 I'd like to see if the, uh, I, you know, the annual conference could have more of an online component to, you know, whether they, mm -hmm. could in, in, whether they could allow um, performances that would not have to be, I mean, it could be, you know, uh, streamed, um, you know, not and, and remote rather than ha having to have everybody uh, who participates fly there. Um, that, that you 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 would get more people, uh, um, uh, you, you know, willing to you know submit or participate uh, if 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 you know if it was kind of baked into the conference itself to have uh, you know online um, capability. Yeah, I think people are quite protective of the in-person aspect. I can see how people who live in remote places or early in their career want to sort of really feel more connected with the scene or want to um, go to one place. But I think it can be really nice to have an event where um, some aspects are focused online and some aspects are focused in person. Uh, maybe on different days having yeah, everything streamed uh, but. a hybrid conference you know some something that would that would that would promote both aspects of it because there, there is enormous benefit from having you know the in-person uh contact but um you know if if if, mm. if, 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 if it could uh you know, bring the the online you know more uh, make, make it more part of the conference yeah i think Hybrid often refers to something where you have a mixture of in-person talks and Zoom calls, um, and that and that can be already disconnected, I think, because people in the room just lose attention when the person isn't there. Um, mm. So I think having an event where there's uh, days focused on in-person talks and performances, and other days focused on online stuff. Can, because like an online stream where you have a different performance every 20 minutes can feel really nice, like connecting with all these people around the world. Um, but if it's if you're sort of beaming in a performance into a club and that person isn't physically present, that can feel really strange and disconnected. So mm. I think it's about having online aspects which really take advantage of all the kind of advantages of being online and sort of in-person aspects which have that physical feel and share it through streaming but not try and mix the two too much because that can kind of compromise both aspects really if that makes sense and and, and, and it can complicate it can complicate things i mean my experience oh um, yeah my experience just in the past in the past few months at the university, they they tried to do a lot of hybrid events between between this Saigon campus and the Melbourne campus, and the number of times that that ends in disaster is startlingly high. Despite us mm -hmm. having a, t despite the name of the university being RMIT, where the T is supposed to be technology, like it's the, it, it's just it doesn't really work, it doesn't work out that way in practice, uh, unfortunately. And so that it might be it, so. Higher mice, it's not to say that the. It's, Maybe I think what Alex is saying is right. Maybe it's better just to have like a, a very serious, like to put more effort to promote and raise the profile or and perceived importance of a, of a purely online event, um, just to encourage yeah. encourage people to really participate and to be to be present and have serious discussions and and so on in a in a purely online thing, so that you don't have to complicate complicate the matter and just like as Alex said, just take really really hone in on the advantages that the online environment yeah. can, can offer mm. yeah um, and the kind of affordances of having sort of online events which uh, don't go over two hour a day or something because if you're staring at the screen for longer than two hours you really disengage <laughs> um whereas an in-person event can be kind of 16 hour days um to really take advantage of everyone being in the same place um, they're just completely different, I think, in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there's a there's probably a case for if you're doing a if you're doing an online 
uh, like, like like a streamed performance there's a case for needing to change the ambience of the place that that is being broadcast at because if it's your standard conference with a smallish screen and a bunch of chairs you know you kind of you kind of need to really spread that out to be a, like a giant screen that's washing over the back wall and a giant sound system just pounding stuff and and you know a real a real strong visual um, component like you, you have to sort of compensate in other ways um, because you, you don't have a performer there who you can you can sort of engage with I guess um, yeah thanks. It's high harmonics I know it's late there for you <laughs> thanks for hanging yeah. with it same same yeah thank uh, thank thank you everyone it was, it was it was great it was really nice yeah thank you so uh, I'm looking forward to talking to all you can soon uh, Bernard uh, what's the best way to contact you um you can uh, you know what you've got my email through the um through the discussion for this so you can ah, fire email okay yeah cool um i hang around on the on the um discord uh for total cycles and super collider and um estuary and hydra so you can catch me on any of those platforms pretty easily i'm not very social i do have a mastodon um a mastodon profile with the Oh, okay. Uh, I'll make uh, sure to follow you there. Yeah, I'm, I'm there as well. So, yeah. Cool. Claudia, nice to meet you. Nice yeah, to meet nice you. To meet you. <laughs> Appreciate it, guys. Nice. Thank you. All right. Very well. Bye. Okay. Bye. See you. Yeah.